Uh, thanks for coming, everybody. I'm Jim Birch. I am a strategist at Xeno Media in the beautiful suburbs of Chicago. Um, I've been a webmaster for 20 years. I used to run e-commerce sites. A few years ago, I made the switch and started to be a Drupal developer. Um, somewhere along the way, I started getting upset with developers uh, who never seemed to think about the webmasters and the people that got the site delivered to them. So I started researching more and more, and this presentation is kind of a culmination of all my efforts. So far, I am always learning. So, what frustrated me the most was that there was so much in Drupal. You know, when I first logged into a site, I got absolutely every single option. You know, the default webmaster role seemed to be the administrator, the same thing that full-on developers got. Um, in the admin menu, it's organized, you know, but if you're a developer and you're dealing with Drupal 6 sites and Drupal 7 sites, things are in completely different places. Uh, different admin themes make, put things in, uh, make things look differently. Um, different modules get stuck in different places. Um, if you're on one site, you kind of can learn your way around, but, you know, it's not that easy. Um, in most admin themes, you have the index page of your administration where it lists all the items one by one and one by one and one and one. And this is my blog, which is a really simple site, and, you know, there's 372,000 things on the admin screen. So, uh, same thing goes for the CK editor. Like, I've seen so many sites that just have the default everything, every button in there. Um, you know, I see a flash button, a table button, an emoji button. I know they're cool, but I can't think of many business reasons why we would build those in. When you can have a really streamlined interface for users, you know, put that down to one row and some really simple things. Um, so, uh, this all led me to who are we making these websites for? Um, a lot of times when we build websites, depending on the size of the shop, we do user personas and role discoveries and we're making up stories about the magical people that are going to come visit our website. You know, all in all, we actually have uh, information on who is going to use this website the most, which would be, you know, the content creators, the administrators of the site. So, what I like to do, and when we're doing that discovery, is consider these users in there. So the most common role in Niagara Brought Up is the webmaster. Yeah, you know, the webmaster can do certain configuration things on the website. Uh, he or she is going to be the you, know, you after you leave. So you can give them a lot more permissions than your average user. Next step down would be an editor. And an editor can use content that has more content specific permissions. They can usually touch other people's content. You know, whether that be publishing it, um, deleting it, moving everything around. Authors. Authors usually have one job, and that is to create content. They usually have permissions to uh, add, edit, and delete their own content, but not other content to the site. Um, we do plenty of sites where we have content-specific roles. So while I may have an author or an editor that can manage the pages of the sites, I can also have a specific role that would be a blogger or a press releaser, probably a better term for that. Um, but they can access one specific content type or two specific content types um, in addition to maybe the author or, you know, they just have a limited scope of what they need to do in the site um, for security reasons, you know, for protection of the site's content and brand. We want to limit them only to those things. And as a 
benefits, they have a really easy user interface to deal with. Um, you can also have task specific roles. So in this, um, the most common one I, I use is a community manager. So a community manager has permissions to set roles on users. So whether that be a public site that you're signing up for and you, you, know, you automatically get subscribed to the site and you're a user, um, or you're an administrator. You know, I may want somebody with the webmaster role and somebody with the editor role to be able to handle this in case the first person is not in the office. So if we put all our permission specific items for you know, managing users into one role, we can assign that, say, as a supplementary role. Um, there are a lot of different use cases. You know, you, in your discovery, you'll find that you have uh, some different users than this. You know, sometimes editor is not even needed in sites I build, um, but these are kind of the go-tos that I've uh, witnessed over the last couple of years. So. Now that we know who these guys are, we can start fighting the big evil blue plastic robot for them. I um, want to talk about site building and installing and uninstalling modules. Um, how many people here are web developers, work for an agency full time? Small amounts. Anybody run a website for a living? You would be the webmaster role? Freelancers. Um, I started a couple years ago. Uh, I was brought on as a front end manager, or front end developer. You know, pretty soon after that, I got put into the project manager role. Um, you know, strategist is kind of what I've evolved into, which probably encompasses everything. Um, the most important thing I've learned, I think, with regards to Drupal, is Drush. Drush is a command line. Is everybody familiar with Drush? Okay. It's a command line uh, tool where you can just type in small little codes and get Drupal to do what you want. Um, there are a lot smarter people here at this conference that can explain it, um, but this command right here, Drush DL download yes, which is the answer to the next question, and the module name. So I can go to drupal.org, find a project, and copy the module name out of the URL. So I want to go there and download views. I can just, instead of going there, downloading the zip file, extracting it, dragging it into my folder, I can just be in the root of my command line and say, just download views, and I have it. The next step is to enable it, drush en module name. If I decide that I don't like it, which happens a lot, you know, the last time I checked there was 372,000 modules that you can use for Drupal. Um, not all of them are, yeah. you know, you may want to disable them and uninstall them. So this can increase your productivity and uh, let you experiment with things that you don't have to commit to a site right away. Um, you know, if you had talked to me three and a half years ago and you told me I would be talking to people about using a command line on a computer, I would have thought you were crazy. Um, but really, once you get the hang of it, it's pretty easy and really helps increase your productivity. Um, but it's Drupal and you can do everything six different ways. Um, you can download the module, put it into the modules folder, once it's there, you can refresh the module screen, and it's there. Click to enable it. Click to disable it. Um, the most important thing when you disable modules in the UI is the uninstall. Um, uninstall will go into the database and remove the little database bits that the module put in there. It's not all the time that you need to, but it's very important to not just delete a module and leave the residue in the database. Um, if then you want to remove it, you know, after you click the uninstall, then you can go in and delete the folder. Um, so a lot of what I do is site building. I'm not a developer, I don't know PHP, but I can, you know, using the command line and using the Drupal UI, 
I can put some great sites together. I can get a site themed to the administrator and you know most of what the features of the website need, you know, probably 80, 90 percent. And then we can go in and get a developer to you know take it that last mile and do what we can't do. So that said, we'll get into the meat of this presentation. Uh, theming for the administration UI. So uh, Drupal 7 uh, has, by default in core, an administration theme. Um, you have your front end theme, which is my nice little logo gym here. Um, and my disabled themes, I have a base theme for my core theme, and I have seven, the default administration theme. That's set on the appearance screen, and there's a checkbox here to use the administration theme when editing or creating content. You can also create, um, not use that, and your forms, your node edit and add forms can be presented in the front end theme. You can also go ahead and use a random theme or a second administration theme, a second theme, an administration theme that you make. You could do whatever you want. You could have one theme here, one theme for the administrator. Uh, my only warning is that if you put your administration work in the front end theme, it may require, require additional styling, additional work. Um, you know, whereas a lot of the administration themes have covered all of the bases that you need to work on. So unless the project that I work on has a bigger budget, we use admin themes most of the time. Um, if you're working in Drupal 6, uh, there is a module, I believe, called the administration theme, which adds this functionality in. So I just kind of went over those things. So basically, your theme options, choose a separate admin theme, use your front end theme, develop your own admin theme. The block system of Drupal applies to administration themes also. So when you go to your blocks page, you have your front end theme and you have your administration theme. Um, seven is a really simple theme. It has two regions, uh, your main content block and your help system. Uh, my in most important advice would be make sure the system help of Drupal is in one of the regions that is available to your users so they can see any messages that you put in there or any messages that modules or Drupal are trying to send to the users. So now here's a bunch of awesome things. Uh, the first thing I do when I install a Drupal site is disable the administration overlay. You know, when you get some, you click on something in the admin, you know, I'm sure at one time in 2007, it was great that these things magically popped open in an Ajax window, and you didn't have to wait, you know, a whole second for a page to load. But I can't stand it. So that's this one, Drush Disable Overlay Module. I also disable the standard toolbar and the shortcut and add in the first one, the admin menu and the admin menu toolbar. Uh, that is this wonderful guy at the top here. So when I want to work on something, you know, I know exactly where it is. Every site I work on is the same and consistent. When I'm building content types and taxonomies, you have a few options that you should always think about and work on you know, for the administrator specifically. So the title label. Um, just because Drupal says a node has a title doesn't mean it has to be a title. Uh, if I have an event contact content type, I can change the title label to event name. Yeah, lots of scenarios for this. It doesn't always have to be stiff and thank you. Um, the explanation or submission guidelines. This one is a big box on your page. It allows you to put in HTML and it goes in the system help that I just pointed out in the block system. 
So a lot of times we struggle with the description for the administration side of the content type. Yeah, it's a blog post. What can I say about it? I think I said create an article or a blog post for the site. It's like poetry. Yeah, but in the ex explanation or submission guidelines, I can point out some things about this content type that I think the user should need to know. So, you know, in my blog post, I use scheduler. It sends out the post at a certain time. The default for my blog post is that it's unpublished because I don't know about you guys, but I can never create a node on the first try. I probably have, you know, 1,400 saves before I feel confident enough to publish it out to the world. So my explanation or submission guidelines, please be sure to schedule or hit publish when the post is ready. The default setting is that this content type is not published. Um, I can also include a link to some step-by-step -step instructions, and I can go over that a little bit later. <coughs> Um, and then author, menu, sitemap, any module we want can hook into that page. So down here you'll see all sorts of stuff. You know, here's the revisions, the display settings. If you want to use Drupal Core as author and date information, um, the buffer module hooks in here, which is a service that posts out to Twitter and Facebook. Uh, XML sitemap, uh, Simplify, which I'll talk about in a minute, web form schedule, a lot of things you can put in will be on this content type screen, your defaults, and you can set it for you know, every piece of content that you have in here. Field defaults are even more granular. You can have help text for each field. Um, you can have the default text format, you know, what it's going to be, a long text field, WYSIWYG, um, individual module settings. Um, I use a module called Fences, which wraps a uh, HTML5 fields around Drupal's um, poor markup. Um, number of values for the field, you know, you can have one, two, three body fields if you want. Um, Usually that field is kind of one, you have one thing, or it's unlimited, you know. So I want to have an image field and I want to let them all upload 20 different things to it. Um, certain field types have very different options, like this is an image field. So, you know, we have help text and names and default image and here's the fences but we can have uh, different file extensions. I can not let them upload pings if I want to. Uh, what is the directory I'm uploading images to? You know, this is always a good one to set. Um, separate them by content type or year or any token value you want. Um, if you want to restrict the size that you can upload, um, you definitely want to enable the alt and title fields. Um, all of this is set on a field-by-field -field basis. And I skipped over one I wanted to show you. Bigger Shop in Chicago, Palantir.net, has created and shared with us, the world, Drupal developers, an awesome spreadsheet um, in a blog that Larry Garfield wrote called Drupal Sites Plan or Perish. Um, this has a Google Sheet, so you can go in and copy it, save it to your own Google Drive, or download it as Excel, and it has a tab for all sorts of different items. So nodes, fields, view modes, flags, node queues, and you can plan your website, including help text, before you build it. It's really easy to change things in the spreadsheets. Um, it's really easy to visualize what you're going to build when you're able to just type, type it all out, blurt it all out. You know, let's me define everything that I need to define for a developer or somebody to go build it later. You know, once it's built in Drupal, it's kind of hard to change, especially when there's content in there. It's almost impossible to change. Um, 
But if you can see it first, then this is a great way to work it out. And it's free, and you know, I've extended it. Um, he doesn't have features in here. Um, there's some things I don't use. I'm not a big field collections guy, um, but mil maybe have you thinking about Drupal in a more visual way. Okay, uh, title module is the next fun module. Um, for the most part, titles are in the templates. Um, you know, every node in Drupal has a title and a body by default. Uh, the title module was made for translatable websites where they needed to have it as a field. Um, I work on one multilingual website, but I use title module on every website I build because it takes the title out of the template and puts it into the UI, into any view modes or displays, so I can choose where that title sits in the display. Hide sticky and promote. This is probably my favorite module. It's a sandbox module. It's not an official module at all. Um, but the first site I ever themed uh, for my company I work for now, I said, I want to put this node on the front page. And I clicked the promote to front page on the bottom of the node screen. And it didn't work. And I asked the developer, that, how come the promote to front page button doesn't work? And she said, we don't use that. <laughs> We've never used that on any site. Well, it's con confusing that it's in there. So by default, you know, Drupal has promote to front page and sticky, which would put it on the top of a archive view. Um, but 99% of Drupal websites don't use this functionality. Um, this module does one thing and it does it well, it just hides those things. Um, there's another module called override node options. If you need to have more granular control of hiding uh, those things, a couple others, um, by role, so hiding it from the author or the blogger role, you can go ahead and use that module. Simplify is the best module in Drupal, period. So Simplify will let you hide so many of the things. Um, you can do it globally. So say I know that I'm not going to use the author information and the date information across the whole site. I can just hide it. Um, I can also hide it on a node-by-node uh, -node basis, on a content type basis. Um, it also lets you hide uh, things on taxonomy, blocks, comments, users, and user profiles. Um, let's pop on over to one. So the simplify settings that I have on this content type, authoring information, text format selection, so that's which text format somebody can use in a WYSIWYG. Uh, publishing options, revision information, menu settings, URL path settings, meta tags, redirects, and sitemap. You know, I can easily clean up the admin UI by excluding those things. So there's usually a text format selector here. There's you know, all sorts of data information that I'm hiding down here. Basically, I am only showing the admin users what I need to, and Simplify helps me out doing that. Field groups. Uh, field groups is a way of adding a field to your administration, administration screen and your front end screen. Um, to help you organize things. So field group lets you go to this guy. Add a vertical tab and group information. This is a huge 
asset node. So I have a client that gives away PDFs and it is very, uh, has a lot of fields on it. <laughs> um, so I have a title and a body. That's kind of the only thing that stands alone. And then the rest is asset information. I make one vertical tab group and then a tab for the featured area. So I have a featured image that goes in your hero and a gallery image that would you know, go next to it. I have the asset details, what type it is. Uh, is it a file or an embed URL? Um, I like to know which is the embed provider um, so I can go responsive with my embeds and you know, I know, you know uh, the slides are different from the videos or different from the audio. I can define all that with that field. Um, they make interactive demos. So basically all of this is the actual asset itself. Um, I have some CRM integration, so I can load a form, a uh, short description to use on the teaser display, um, a whole bunch of taxonomies where they segment their audiences, um, and then related items. When this is displayed to the user, I have my title in my body, and then I have my field set. Doesn't seem so overwhelming. You know, I have my featured images, I have my asset details, I have the uh, CRM information, short description, Segmentation, that one gets a little long, and then the related resources. Basically, everything is near where it needs to be and makes some kind of semantic sense. You can also get back over here. Use field groups on the front end side of things. So this is this display of the node. Um, the site uses bootstrap grid system. I can add a top container and a bottom container, and that adds a div class equals container. I can add a row, div class equals row, and then a top left section and a top right section. So I can put in simple divs without touching the template system. All of this is done in the UI and I can change the layout of the site by the display. You know, and then using entity view modes, you can have different displays of it. I have a default, the teaser, you know, what happens when this asset's in a sidebar, I want to hide a whole bunch of things, and only have an image and a title maybe linked back to itself. All in all, you know, it's an administration tool and a front end tool. Here are all the types you can do, uh, field sets, horizontal tabs, vertical tabs, accordions, divs, and other HTML elements. So you could you know, put things in spans or H1s or tables if you wanted to. Uh, the only advice I would have is to um, kind of keep a consistent theme throughout your admin site and of course throughout your front end. Uh, environment indicator. Uh, this one is a pretty simple item. It adds an indicator to what site you're on. So if you're working in multi-environments, um, we use a local dev, a staging server, and a production server. So uh, my pictures here are from my blog. I have a production and a dev. Uh, the blue says that I am on the live site. The red says that I'm on the red site, on, on my local site, dev site. Um, I have more and more clients that are looking to work in staging sites these days. You know, they want to work on this one pricing page where you know, they're going to mock it up 16 different times and show their uh, stakeholders before they take that content and move it live. It is a good reassurance to make sure people that are on the you know, staging site, they don't want to be making changes on the live site. That's what environment indicator is good for. I think this is the last guy in here. Yeah, dashboards. Uh, when you first log into a site, you know, uh, when you had Yahoo, it used to be my Yahoo, 
now it's just default dashboards. Basically a landing page where you are going to you know, have your tasks presented to you and Drupal has a variety of different options. Um, the default content screen lists all the nodes. As simple as can be, doesn't give you any cue of what you need to do. Uh, there is dashboard module. Uh, it comes in core and you can put different views, blocks, whatever you want on there. So you can, as an administrator, decide what goes on that page. Um, Workbench, which I'm going to talk about in a few minutes, is a workflow module that gives different people, uh, different users, uh, different things to do. So uh, it has its own dashboard and it will present things like, here are the items you need to look at. You know, if an author said these are ready to publish and you're an editor, an editor would need to look at those items. Um, you may just want to see the last 10 pieces of content that's been created on the site. You can put all that stuff on a dashboard. Um, and any administration views that you want of the data. Um, there's no right way, there's no wrong way. Um, the best way is one way. You know, Don't have all four of these options in there because it just leads to confusion. So now that we've got the core Drupal set up. Let's talk about CK Editor. It's kind of the default. It's going into core in Drupal 8. Um, talked a little bit about changing the buttons to only what you need. Uh, you can do that on a field by field basis. Um, both the WYSIWYG module which uses CK Editor and the CK Editor uh, module itself um, have filters that you can apply. Make sure that you research what users can put in and uh, you, know, you want to exclude PHP. There's some libraries out there that can exclude cross-site scripting. Um, you never know what a user is going to go out and copy off of the internet. Hey, I want to do this cool JavaScript thing that I found on Stack Overflow and stick it in there and you know, it's a total vulnerability. Um, I've never had anything happen maliciously, but accidentally you can, you know, allow bad things through. Um, you want to remove markup that's already in your templates. Uh, so by default, there's a uh, the markup selector. You want to remove the H1. You know, chances are you are going to define what the page is. Uh, this is uh, page title is in the template. It's very important for SEO that you don't allow your users to fight against themselves, basically. Uh, instead, you can add formats. So a dropdown, you can define a class like .h1. It will look like the h1. It will give the user and the designer exactly what they want, um, but without the bad SEO wrap. Um, CK Editor is a world of its own. You can become a CK Editor developer if you want to. I wouldn't recommend it, um, but there are a lot of JavaScript, JavaScript configurations that you can set. Um, so by default, CK Editor is really big. You can set a, a JavaScript element to set the height of each of them. Um, there is a, an allowed content JavaScript uh, configuration that says you will, are allowing content to return that you didn't make, uh, that CK Editor didn't make. So if you ever experience loading a page and having the content missing, it's probably because it had some classes or divs in there that you added manually, and CK Editor says, oh, I didn't do this, I'm just going to not display it. You need to set that in the config. Um, you can make CK Editor widgets. This is probably within the last year as of CK Editor 4.3, but you can make your own buttons in CK Editor. It is the coolest thing ever. You can make a little pop-up window, and you can say, I want to grab an image node, and I want to have it float right and be 400 pixels wide. Um, it's 
pretty intensive. Uh, you need to make a module for Drupal. Um, but I sat through the widgetizing widgets by Brandon Neal at the Chicago Drupal Camp this past spring, um, mid camp, mad camp, and it was totally fascinating. And I hope to one day implement it, something just for fun. Um, but uh, I have the link here. If you're interested in that, go check it out. Uh, there's a video of the presentation. He also included all the code to get you started and um, a bunch of references. Okay, uh, uploading images in the WYSIWYG. And if you were in here in the last session, I asked the question of the gentleman given the responsive images, um, you know, about uploading responsive images or displaying responsive images, because it's pretty important. You know, your users are going to want to have control of that body field, and they're going to want to stick images into the body. So where do they go? What do they look like? Um, what type of files can be uploaded? Uh, the thumbnails that are created when you upload them. You know, every kind of CMS, WordPress has it, Drupal has it. You know, if you upload through IMCE or CK Finder, you can define multiple images to use. There's also responsive images that you can use. Where can they be uploaded? Um, I've seen too many sites where they're uploaded by default to the root images folder. Great for a few months, maybe a few years, but four years later when you have 9,000 images in one folder, when you go to load the next image, it's going to take you three minutes for that IMC to pop open. So I like to organize them, you know, depending on the contents, however I can. So I'll go over that now. CK Finder is a premium extension to the CK Editor. Uh, it costs 100 bucks a year, I think. Um, you can define where you're uploading content by content type. So you make a profile type called full HTML blog post. And you can set the text format for that content type to use that. And I'm going to set the upload folder to that specifically. IMCE, which is the most common image uploader file browser, um, you can set different upload folders per user role. You can also do a lot of PHP items, user, user ID, year, month, you know, like WordPress does. Um, possibilities there, a little bit more limited, but it's way more uh, common. Uh, the last thing I wanted to address is the Paragraphs module. Paragraphs module uh, allows you to define different types of paragraphs. Um, this is a kind of different school of thought, whereas instead of having one body field where you try to do everything inside the WYSIWYG, um, you allow multiple paragraphs. So you could have 10 different WYSIWYGs on the page, one that's for text, one that's for an uh, image or a block quote pulled to the right, one that's for a gallery or a slideshow, one that's for a video. So instead of just having one field, you can have multiple fields that do their own specific thing that get rendered collectively as a normal body field would. So it's pretty cool, requires a lot of thought you know, to plan uh, out and probably a lot more tweaking on the way as your content editors think of new and cool ways to display their content. So uh, that leads to the next section, administrative workflows, um, scheduler. Uh, why isn't this in core? I don't know. I mean, I've had it in WordPress since 1.0. I need to say that I want to publish this blog post at 8 o'clock in the morning New York time when people are going to see it. Uh, the only difference is, so a scheduler can be set up to be used by only some people, uh, certain content types. Um, the only thing you need to worry about is uh, there's something called cron and uh, we cache WordPress so hard, we want WordPress to be asleep as much as possible um, and render static HTML and not work so hard. Um, 
Only problem with that is that if the page didn't change, Drupal doesn't necessarily know it. So cron is a server doodad, let's call it. And it comes in and wakes Drupal up at the time frame you say. So every 15 minutes it says, hey, Drupal, do you need to do anything? Drupal says, yes, I need to schedule this post. I need to switch it from unpublished to published, and then the rest happens. Yeah. If Kron comes and says, hey, do you need to do anything, Drupal? Drupal says no, and he's like, okay, I'll see you again in 15 minutes. So that's pretty easy to set up on servers where you have control panels or Plesk. Um, if you have your own shared hosting, a developer can help set that up. Workbench, I alluded to it earlier. Um, it's a suite of modules from the fine folks at Palantir that made that awesome spreadsheet. Uh, this is kind of the missing piece to the published or unpublished. So by default, uh, each content type can have any number of statuses. Uh, the workbench moderation, which is the most important module of the workbench suite, adds draft and needs review. So uh, think of an author can take something and publish it or change the status from draft to needs review and needs review to draft. An editor can say, I can take it from needs review to published or needs review back to draft. So I can set views up based on that in the admin and the editor can say, yes or no, I want to publish this. The author can say, yes, this is ready to be published. Um, workbench, workbench access can restrict access to different sections of the site um, and that can be based on a menu structure that you have, whether that be the main menu or another menu that you make specifically for this purpose, um, or taxonomy. So anything taxed with gift shop, you know, only the gift shop people can have access to. And then Workbench Media adds the same uh, structure from work Workbench Moderation to either branch of the media module. Um, so if you upload a video and the, IT, or the communications department says this video is ready to go, an editor can say yes, that video is fine to publish or no, you guys are crazy, go back and edit that some more. So the last section of my presentation here is documentation. So, you know, kind of throughout this presentation I talked about the inline documentation. Every single piece of Drupal has descriptive and most likely instructional text for the administrative to users to have. Um, the instructional text will allow for HTML. So if you want to link to resources, um, if you want to have your you know, calendar linked to the blog post, you know, just make sure this blog post fits in with our content scheduling, or our content calendar. Yeah, you can put that in there. Um, I link to uh, off-site documentation, so I make my documentation in Google Docs and then export them into PDFs and save them on a shared drive, a Dropbox, or you know another part of the server. Those can be linked to from that section. Uh, the advanced help module allows developers to hook into that also. So the uh, advanced help displays, if you have that module turned on, most contrib modules will have a page describing what the module does. Um, your Developers that make custom modules can also hook into this and apply instructions, helpful, yeah, even a, hey, my name is Charlie and I made this module in 1997, yeah, my phone number is 312 blah blah blah, give me a call if it breaks, would help. So the external docs, um, I think Google Docs is great. Um, some people don't, they use Dropbox, Company Internet. Um, we keep a master copy of the, the document, uh, share permission between who can edit it um, in a secure folder, 
and then you can export the unchangeable instructions in a PDF or a locked doc um, and share those with who's going to actually use it um, with the appropriate role. So I make my documents so the same administrative role structure I have for the sites is available in document form. So the authors can ac access the author docs, the editors can access the author and the editor docs, the webmasters can access them all. And, you know, as silly as they seem, they are just step-by-step -step instructions. In the administration menu, under my workbench, select create content article, enter the title of the article, enter the name of the author, you know, as silly as it seems, you know, working through the steps that you need to do to create this piece of content really helps and it serves as a reference later. Training document for new employees, yeah, just the fact that this lives adds common sense to the common sense. Include screenshots where you can. Um, in this instance, this is an article, or this is an author training doc, so I have add article, create a gallery, add an emergency alert, add a multimedia, add videos, add sound slides, edit items, and then from there, editors have different content types that they can access. Add an issue, send an issue, add a page, add a web form, and then they have a whole different section of moderation tasks. They can approve articles, how to view them all, how to work with node queues or entity queues, taxonomy, manage people. And then finally, webmaster, who would have all of those permissions, can really work on the queues, taxonomies, people, blocks, managing blocks. It wasn't really a really technical webmaster on that website. There we go. So once you have all that, um, you know, as you build all that, things to remember is that you should test and tweak early and often. Those documents are created kind of at the last minute. I have a rough outline as I make the sites, um, but the screen captures may come at the end of the process. Um, things change often enough where you don't want to lock yourself in, but you do want to monitor as you go. So if you're building these sites, don't always use the site as the administrator. Especially, don't always use the site as user number one of the Drupal because that will give you a false sense of security if you have other administrators working with you. So use the site early and often as your different roles. Uh, step through the documentation tasks as you've defined them at the end and adjust permissions as you can go. If you're left with a daunting permission screen of 9,243 things to check, um, you will miss some things. Um, how to be another user. Uh, there's a module called Masquerade, which you can use. It's just a little uh, autocomplete where you can type in, I want to be Joe, and hit submit, and you will be Joe. Um, I don't really use that because once you're Joe, you have to log out anyways and log back in because Joe doesn't have permission to use the Masquerade module. Um, instead, I just create different accounts on every website I make. So uh, we are a Google accounts, a Gmail users, um, and there's the plus trick in Gmail, but you can have your name plus something else. It will be a unique email address for Drupal, but it would still, anything you get emailed from the site would still go back to your main email. So on all my sites, I have Jim, Webmaster, Jim plus Editor, Jim plus Author. And I can log out, log back in, and you know see the site as I need to. You can also do this with any other emails or fake emails. You, know, you just need to rem remember your username and accounts for not just you, but now the different roles that you're creating. 
And that's it for this presentation. Um, there's so much more. I'm always learning. Um, but I hope you enjoyed. And anybody have any questions on the wide array of topics that I've covered in the admin UI? Going once, twice. Well, thank you for staying and uh, listening and attending. Hope you guys learn everything that you came to learn and more. <laughs>